Good morning. Thank you for joining us as we have some great conversation uh, about the moment and the movement. Um, like so often, uh, when you're doing a show and you got such a prominent guest, uh, Derek Johnson, who is the president and CEO of the NAACP, will talk more about his bio a little bit later. Uh, right now, he's actually doing an interview uh, with CNBC. If you watched Morning Joe earlier this morning, you saw he was a guest on that show. And I'll tell you, uh, part of the reason that I, I think he's having a tremendous amount of engagement, uh, many of you know there's been a tremendous amount of conversation uh, around um, voter suppression, or at least the belief of voter suppression, uh, centered around everything that's happening within the Postal Service. Uh, and uh, Derek and I talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. Uh, but if you're not aware, uh, the Surgeon General, actually Derek is signing on right now. So I'll just uh, wait and introduce him and we'll start the conversation. Uh, but welcome, uh, very excited to have you here. Uh, very excited uh, to have Derek to sign on. I was just doing a little small talk, uh, Derek, as you prepare uh, to come on. Uh, so thanks for joining us and I'm gonna kind of open the program and then formally introduce you in just a second. Great. Uh, so thanks for joining us again. Uh, uh, we're gonna be talking about some issues uh, during this session. Uh, we're calling it the moment, uh, the movement. Um, my name is Michael Crystal, uh, International President of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity, and super excited to have with us this morning, uh, Mr. Derek Johnson, uh, President and CEO of the NAACP. Uh, you know, when you think about 2020, like so many watching, it's been a very tough year. Uh, you know, if you go back to March and think about the pandemic and clearly has changed all of our lives, uh, when we think back uh, during the course of this year, 170,000 plus deaths. And we know when mainstream population has a cold, it disproportionately impact our community greater. So thusly, we end up having the pneumonia. Uh, the data says that many of us know people who have either engaged in death or have been impacted by COVID-19. Uh, we know that during the course of this year, uh, we've witnessed a significant amount of senseless deaths of African-American men and women uh, to uh, the police. And we know that through the social media uh, campaign, today would be a great day uh, for the cops who murdered Breonna Taylor being arrested. We also know that the pandemic had a huge impact and uh, put a lot of pressure on the economy. And so we know that with that, there was obviously greater impact uh, within our community. And you know, when you think about all that I just described, we know that the occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue has did more to champion division uh, when the reality is we've been needing more coming together uh, within this country. And so, this morning, I'm just super excited to introduce our guest. Uh, Derek Johnson is the president and CEO of the NAACP, a uh, 111 year old organization. Um, Derek, this October, you will be in your role three years. Uh, he is a proud alumnus of Tougaloo College. Uh, he's, he's currently living in Jackson, Mississippi my home state. Uh, Derek, you should know that when I was a kid uh, growing up in Grenada, Mississippi, uh, if you had an opportunity to go to Jackson, Mississippi, you were doing something big. Uh, so <laughs> uh, so you're, you're living in the best that Mississippi has to offer. Uh, but so excited to have you, certainly excited to have you on the morning after the Democratic uh, Convention. Uh, when you think about the convention, uh, I know um, you have a virtual conference coming up this fall. Uh, we've had many uh, virtual regional conferences. But, you know, when I think back to these last four days, I think by and large, uh, the Democrats did a pretty good job of uh, managing a virtual conference. The logistics were pretty good. The theatrics were pretty good. I thought the moderator did a pretty good job of keeping the pace. Uh, but certainly it was a historic conference as well, uh, seeing and witnessing uh, Kamala Harris being nominated uh, to be the vice president of uh, 
of a major Democratic Party, giving a huge shout out uh, to her HBCU, giving a huge shout out to her sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha, uh, and certainly giving a huge shout out to uh, the Divine Nine. Uh, but Derek, I got to believe when you look back on this conference, uh, certainly there got to be a lot of things that you probably like, but there, all, there probably were some things that you would have liked to have seen more. Give me some color and insight of your thoughts about the conference and certainly welcome to visiting with us this morning. Right. First of all, I want to thank you for allowing me the opportunity and uh, the men of 5 Sigma uh, for being a strong supporter of NAACP. Uh, I recall when we talked earlier uh, this year around the concept of doing something uh, to around the our, our organizational hymn, the Black National Anthem, uh, because uh, James Wells of Johnson is a proud member was a proud member of Phi Beta Sigma. Uh, you know, it's something special about our black institutions across the board. Uh, we are stronger together. And, and if you, you scratch the surface hard enough, you will see that we are a member of all of the same uh, set of organizations because our black institutions, our historic institution is what make up the black community and has informed the culture. Uh, you know, this week has been a historic week. Uh, when you look back at the convention, uh, the fact that they were able to produce such a uh, seamless, what seemed to be a very seamless convention virtually, mm -hmm. uh, was ironic about it. Much of what we seen was taped over 12 days ago. Uh, yeah. uh, what I did was over two weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, and I know uh, the facilitator, Congressman Thompson, who chaired the convention, uh, he taped all four days, what, one day last Friday. Uh, he took four changes of clothes. So uh, the way they were able to stitch that together and make it seem seamless as if it was happening real time uh, was amazing. Uh, but what was the most beautiful part of that convention is to see uh, what it would look like to have adults in a room in an administration. Yes. To hear the former first lady just so regal and, and sharp and to to hear the former president, just the voice of clarity, uh, the compassion we heard of, of the VP nominee uh, and the fact that she's just so smart mm -hmm. and gifted. And, and I'm loving the fact that she's embracing all of her culture. She is a black woman of, 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 of Asian, South Asian descent and she embraced all of her culture. And that's a beautiful thing because when you when I seen the convention over the last four days, I seen America, I seen black and I seen white, male, female, uh, uh, Latino, uh, South Asians, Asians. I I seen America, and that's what we should be working towards: uh, having a governance that look like America, so the public policy can impact all of America, not just some of America. Yeah, yeah, I thought they did a great job, and um, I love your comments around how the conference was truly a reflection of Americana. Uh, and I thought they did a great job around it. Uh, but let's get into some of the issues and things that are certainly important to the NAACP. And I kind of touched on it in my comments on, as I opened up, really talking about uh, the tremendous amount of police brutality that has occurred of recent. Uh, you and I both know um, it appears that this brutality became uh, mainstream this year. We've witnessed uh, Rodney King back in the 90s. Uh, we know uh, Eric Garner uh, was yelling he couldn't breathe. Uh, but something was a little different uh, when we witnessed the eight minutes and 46 seconds of uh, George Floyd screaming uh, for his life. Uh, but talk to us a little bit, uh, Derek, on what you and your organization are doing uh, to really address uh, police brutality that is occurring within our communities and how do we uh, make some meaningful differences uh, in addressing that? You know, when you look at, uh, I call it aggressive policing, you really, it, it, it plays out in several different ways. Uh, but what's common across the board is the lack of a federal policy standards. Uh, we need to address the issue of qualified immunity. Uh, no one should be able to operate above the law because there's no accountability metrics there. And qualified immunity is judicially imposed standard that say that uh, law enforcement officers, uh, if they engage in what otherwise would be misconduct, should be hired to, held to a higher standard, which is almost impossible to hold them accountable. There needs to be a national database of police misconduct. 
uh, officers should not be able to engage in misconduct at one agency and then move to a neighboring agency. That's what happened with Tamir Rice, with the 12 year old playing cops and robbers in a park was killed by an officer who had uh, engaged in misconduct in, a, in a, another agency and was able to go to an, a neighboring agency and, and uh, get employment and his record didn't follow him. There was no way to, to check. Uh, you cannot, in whatever profession uh, uh, you choose to operate in, operate with a level of, of impunity, with no accountability, and even if you do some wrong, go and move on to the next thing without being held accountable, or at least your record following you. Uh, that should be the standard across the board. And so there, there is a lot to be done with federal policy, public policy, it is what's needed that looks forward and not protect special interests of the fraternal order of police. You know, uh, earlier this summer, uh, there were two competing bills. Um, certainly the House introduced police reform and uh, the Senate introduced uh, some police reform uh, acts as well. But, you know, when you kind of look through them, um, the Senate one certainly, I described it as an empty suit. It really just talked yeah. about permissions. It talked about some bureaucracy, uh, but it appeared to have been that the House was bill was really doing a lot of what you described. And uh, as I kind of combed through the data, uh, and I would certainly welcome some insight from you, uh, it looked like a lot of the initiatives that were coming from our premier civil rights organizations had been incorporated uh, within that House bill. So can you talk a little bit about that level of collaboration that might have occurred that uh, stimulated that? You know, you, you look at the members of the Congressional Black Caucus, particularly in the House, we have a tremendous number of members who are in leadership positions. A lot of them are members of our Black institutions. Therefore, it gives us an easier one way to engage in the type of dialogue to help inform what the formation of the public policy going through their uh, subcommittee committees or whatever comes out of the final bill. And AACP, that's part of our, our role. So we were in ongoing communications uh, with members of the House and the Senate, but particularly the House, because we knew uh, based on data collected, based on experiences and what has worked in different jurisdictions, uh, what was needed. And, and, and I'm glad to be positioned along with several other of our black institutions to be a part of that dialogue. But there's no substitute for being in power. And I tell black folks that having a title don't give you power, using the title is where the power is. And we have a lot of members of the CBC who actually uh, are willing to use the power they have, whether they have a title or not, to ensure the needs and interests of our communities are heard and met through the formation of public policy. Yeah, and I, you know, when you think about the convention that you just talked about, and you think about all the social unrest that was happening this summer, and then you start thinking about, you know, how do we move from protest to policy, as you just kind of teed up? Um, obviously, we got a big election forthcoming. And I know for us, um, I always have a little prop. Uh, for us, uh, <laughs> back in December, uh, we have our official organ, which is called the Crescent Magazine. But it was in December of 2019, Derek, that we published the Battle for America, where we spelled out in very clear specifics on what we wanted to do to prepare our chapters and prepare our members uh, for uh, the upcoming election. Uh, but I'd like for you to talk to me a little bit about, you know, what have you and your organization done to really look at the, I call it the trifactor, and that is, uh, voter registration, I call it the gateway towards democracy. Uh, and so we certainly got to have voter registration. Uh, it certainly has to be a level of engagement uh, centered around uh, voter education, uh, but also mobilization. And huge compliment to you and your organization. Uh, I know that um, over the last few weeks, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of conversation around, uh, I call it the shenanigans that's been happening with the Postal Service. Uh, many people believe uh, it's just a catalyst uh, to inhibit voter suppression. Uh, when you think about the pandemic and creating as many opportunities for our citizens to advance their vote in the most safe environment, uh, certainly uh, mail-in would be one of the uh, catalysts to do it. 
Uh, but talk to us a little bit about what you've done on the lawsuit that you filed against the Postal Service. And you didn't just file it on the Postal Service. You actually filed it on the Postmaster General as well. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about what your organization is doing just around that whole trifecta of uh, preparing for the election. And then give us some color around what you've done with the uh, postal situation. So you mentioned October will be three years in this position for me. And when I uh, uh, took the position, I had 2020 election in mind. Uh, we needed to get prepared organizationally and in our community for this election cycle, but also understand that this cycle should not be seen as the transaction of the one day election. That the arc of democracy is a five year trend. You evaluate and then you put together the plan for the next five years. So walking in the door said, okay, we gotta get prepared for the midterm election but we have to be more disciplined in our approach. So we partnered with a data science team to identify where can we have the impact if we engage in a strategy. Impact measured by how do we increase voter turnout by five to 7% uh, over the last similar cycle of African-Americans who are, are irregular voters. These are people who vote sometime but not all the time. How do we talk to them to get them to the polls? So we had a pilot in nine states in 20. 18 midterm election. And we learned from that pilot and we did some more data analysis and we, we cleaned up the database because you know with databases, if you don't if you don't keep it clean, it gets stale real fast or it's junk in, junk out. So we cleaned it up more, work with the data science team, looking at midterm elections in 2019, perfecting the model, all in preparation for 2020. And in 2020, what we identified is 11 states that we're gonna play heavy in. In those 11 states, we've identified the congressional races, uh, the, the, the legislative state races. We're working now and pulling together the data for the district attorney races, and I'll explain that one later. Uh, and understanding in those 11 states, we can impact 190 electoral votes by increasing infrequent voter turnout of African Americans by five to seven percent. That's really key because it's that five to seven percent that caused. Uh, the outcome of the 2016 election to be different. Mm -hmm. You know, for the first time in 20 years, we've seen uh, the turnout of the black community to go down for the first time in 20 years. Up to that point, it had been going up every, every cycle. And so we got to make up ground. And so we've been focusing on that. Voter registration is a, is a huge factor in that, but we have people who are already registered to vote. And so with that, we are working with partners to target those areas so we can help turn out the vote in those areas. When you look at the, uh, the, the post office and the postmaster general, the president stated clearly last week that he was gonna do all he could to stop universal uh, uh, mail, uh, vote, vote by mail. Mm -hmm. Under any other circumstance, you saying that with any level of authority, that would be a, you'd be, it'd be a criminal act, right? But you get your postmaster general to come in, uh, disconnect uh, uh, sorting machines, that are very efficient and effective at getting the mail out there. You cut back on overtime for postal workers when the volume of mail is only gonna increase, not decrease, and you're not gonna hire any additional people. But the lawsuit is saying, you didn't even go through your internal procedures mm -hmm. to make the changes because the postal service has specific procedures that you have to go through before an oversight board to get the necessary approvals. And so that's why we filed it against the Postmaster General because he made these changes without going through his internal procedures, but it's illegal. But most importantly, the collateral damage is gonna have on so many people in our community because we have folks who depend on medicine through the mail. Yes, yes. All right, yeah. uh, I, I come from the space of, of, of this cliche, when we fight, we win. Right. And we must fight. Right, right. You know, wow, what great insight that you just gave. Um, you know, that whole postal conversation was very consistent with the occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, and that is chaos. Uh, right on the heels of the election forthcoming, uh, a lot of smart people in this audience, a lot of smart people involved. Uh, that kind of a wholesale change right in advance of the election, uh, it's gotta be a marketing nightmare, but you have to believe well, that might have been intentional. You just kind of have to believe that. Um, and then when you kind of transition it away from just thinking about the postal crisis, and then just start thinking about what happened in 2016. You know, the data tells us that uh, not only did we not show up as strong in 2016, uh, but disproportionately African-American men didn't show up as strong. 
And so are you and your organization doing anything around targeting uh, major growth in respect to registration or mobilization around African-American men? The sisters have Absolutely. done a great job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, they're making us look bad. They're making they us, make look us look bad. bad. Yes. <laughs> So we, 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 we are able to disaggregate the data and just target males out of that data. Uh, but the data shows everybody. And, and so for some of our partners, they say, you know, we want to target this area and we want men. We can give you that data to start working that community. Uh, we're hoping to launch a partnership with some of the sports franchises uh, to appeal to African-American males. And if not with the specific franchises, with some of these stars, both current and former, to communicate on the platforms where we, where we view. You know, ESPN.com, that's a huge uh, platform where a lot of African-American men uh, spend, spend some, a substantial amount of time. Uh, you know, my 20-year-old son, 21 now, uh, he, he is bored to no wits because everything is virtual. And so when I walk into the room or I see him, he's constantly on either ESPN.com or he's excited that uh, basketball has started again. But yes. that's all of his friends, you yes. know. Uh, and now he's not on campus. I, I hear them talking. They're talking about sports. Well, that's the area we need to have a conversation with African-American men to, to turn out the vote, to show the value in voting and the reality that we're sitting in as a result of the 2016 election and we can turn it around. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's such a huge election. Uh, so many critical issues that are being faced. Uh, you know, as we were having the conversation around police reform, the two bills that are uh, in the Senate and the one in the House and with this election forthcoming, uh, we got a huge opportunity, whoever wins, uh, our yeah. organization, your organization, uh, we got an opportunity come 2021 to be strong advocates uh, for real change because um, I think as we go forward, um, the social unrest that inspired a nation to wake up, um, and as we think about uh, systemic racism that we've endured uh, for just an extensive amount of time, uh, we've got an opportunity to do some things significantly different through the ballot box but also through policy decision-making and certainly looking forward to that opportunity of working with you and uh, delivering such a thing. Yeah. Um, talking a little bit about not just um, police brutality and uh, social unrest, um, you know, economic empowerment and economic development is critical. Um, and, you know, when you think about racism and you start qualifying it with systemic racism, it gives a whole different meaning because when you say systemic racism, it kind of is all inclusive. It's all over yeah. here. Right? And um, share with us uh, some of the things that you specifically have done to really try to drive uh, better economic engagement within our communities. Uh, what you might have done to uh, establish partnerships, partnerships, excuse me, uh, with any major companies to drive uh, better engagement uh, within their ranks. Uh, but really give us some insight on what you and your organization are doing for economic uh, development for the African-American community. So we, we played a large role in, in making sure that the PPP funds will be made available to Black businesses. Uh, we were part of the conversation before the original adoption, after the uh, program was adopted in care, the first CARES Act. Uh, we became an advocacy voice around far too many small black businesses could not reach it. Uh, we then uh, created a series of webinars with CPAs and attorneys who are specialized in the program as we work with uh, Congress on the second allocation uh, and worked hard to get somewhat of a set aside. There's still over a billion dollars sitting in that pot uh, mm -hmm. for small businesses. If you go on our website, uh, we partnered with the, an entity called Diversity Capital so we can make sure people qualify for PPP funds. Uh, and we also advocated to have much of those funds converted. We called it a, a safe harbor uh, for entities got, that receive under $2 million. If they uh, uh, check the box and did what was necessary, the money convert from a loan to a grant. Uh, we did that for small businesses. We then rolled out a project with uh, Beyonce's uh, foundation, Baygood where we identified uh, 20 businesses that hadn't been impacted 
uh, first by the protest, then by COVID and $10,000 grants. We're gonna be rolling out uh, uh, two other programs very similar. We're now looking at a, a, a third party partner uh, as a way to identify new metrics to determine how business can qualify for access to capital. Uh, the credit scoring uh, model oftentimes is skewed away from eligibility. Uh, we identified a partner who have a new model and we're building out a banker relationship to try to accelerate that. Uh, in addition to that, we are in ongoing uh, conversations and strategy meetings with Robert Smith and his team around the 2% concept. And with the 2% concept, figuring out how do we get uh, the top companies to park 2% of their revenue uh, in a space where uh, we can have more access to capital. Uh, we've seen that take place with Netflix that deposited uh, some of their money in black banks. If black banks get more uh, capital, they can do more loans. And if they give more loans, then our, we can have access to money. So uh, those are just some of the things. And, and we, we have other projects that we're in discussion around, but it is, it is vitally critical that we start looking at larger numbers. Uh, someone making an announcement they're going to do $10 million is pennies on the dollar if they're a multi-billion dollar operation. It's a rounding error. And so we got to continue to push up the hill so we can get more. But as we get more, we got to make sure we're pulling up with dump trucks and not wagons. <laughs> I like that metaphor. Uh, but, you know, I thought your partnership with Beyonce was very innovative. It was certainly creative. Uh, I thought the value of the um, contract, if you will, uh, was $10,000. And, you know, you think about Beyonce and you're like $10,000. That might not sound like a lot, but boy, to a small business, that's some serious money. Huge. And specifically within our community is extremely relevant. But, you know, like a, a good interviewer, I did a little research, Derek. And, and I saw that um, you've been in some good conversation with CBS Studios. Uh, oh, yeah. you, you announced something uh, in July uh, that maybe our audience might not be familiar with. Talk to us a little bit about the partnership that you're doing with CBS Studios. Sure. So it, I mean, it's a good example. We got to push harder up the hill. And uh, we are, CBS is now part of the Viacom family. We have a relationship with BT, which is also Viacom, with the Image Awards show. But as we begin to talk up to CBS specifically, uh, we want to talk beyond writing a check. We, we understand how people see us on the screen is how they treat us in the streets, uh, yeah. whether it's Birth of the, of the Nation, uh, which was our second biggest advocacy campaign from our founding in 1915. Uh, that movie is credited with the sp uh, spread of the Ku Klux Klan as we know it. Uh, the Klan was a small fledgling, uh, fledgling organization until that film came out and you've seen the, uh, the white damsel in distress around the African natives who were about to you know, violate her and the Klan come riding in and save the day. Uh, that image within itself uh, grew Klan membership to the point that by 1930, there were more members of the Klan in states like Indiana, Illinois, than they were in states like Mississippi, Georgia, or uh, uh, Alabama. Uh, images have power. And so as we began to talk to CBS, we talked about being uh, uh, in the space of creating content not just responding to content. Uh, that conversation matured and it matured to the point that we signed a five-year development deal uh, with CBS Studios to create content, TV shows, mini series that better reflect who we are as a community. And what's fascinating about the relationship, and I didn't know this, CBS Studios is not held hostage just to CBS or the Viacom family. Uh, they produce content for all of the platforms, ABC, Netflix, Quibi. And so our goal is to put a strong team in place and begin to uh, uh, hear and pitch ideas so we can start getting shows that, that reflect us on the air. And final point to that, can, you know, you think about last year was the first movie of the life of Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. And we all grew up learning and knowing about Harriet Tubman. But there's never been any treatment on James Weldon Johnson. There's never been any treatment on W.B. Du Bois. There's never been any treatment on Ida B. Wells. There's so much rich content in our community. Uh, that's, the stories have never been told on the screen. We know it, uh, mm -hmm. but it's never been told on the screen. You know, when I saw that, what you just said is what struck a chord with me. 
You talk about advancing civil rights in a whole different platform and a whole different space, but still driving the same objective. Uh, I love your comment around investing in the organization. We certainly welcome that. Uh, we see relevance of it, but boy, when we have an opportunity to influence the outcome, when we have an opportunity to serve in roles of what kind of images are that we're gonna put forward, and then we have an opportunity to create some level of profits that are generated back to us. I mean, that's called a huge win. And, and I thought that was just a great example of us uh, doing some non-traditional things that's still advancing the value of the core of your mission. Uh, and I thought uh, a huge compliment to you on driving that and something, uh, I'll be honest with you, I didn't know that. Uh, when I read it, it put a nice smile on my face. And the things that you just described is what I thought about. What a great opportunity uh, as the little girls are looking at Kamala Harris and saying, wow, that could be me. And then right. we have an opportunity to create images as you just described behind the camera. Yeah, the camera, being in front of that camera is attractive and that's kind of what we're more accustomed to. But when we have an opportunity to influence that content, we have a chance to drive that real change. And, and that's what I saw. And I thought that was something uh, you and your organization should be extremely proud of. Um, I yeah, you know, it, it goes, we can, we can do well and do good. And mm -hmm. that's, that's the much we should be uh, working towards doing well and do, doing good. But also understand that our Black institutions, uh, we need stronger stewardship. Yes. Uh, we don't we don't always treat our institutions well. We love them, we embrace them, we 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 display them. But if you look behind the the door and under the kitchen sink, it ain't the piping ain't right. Right. <laughs> it's a rust down there, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's a rust. So it is it, it's, it's it, we are in this moment where we must retool and yeah. replenish our institutions so they can last another hundred and eleven years or another hundred years because. Uh, for the time, for the times that you and I wear these seats, we must be good stewards so we can pass these seats off to others, so they can then take our stewardship and build on. Absolutely. I talk a little bit about. We talked about social injustice. We've talked a lot about uh, voter uh, and the election forthcoming. But I also know that you guys have been working on environmental injustices. Give us some Absolutely. color and insight of what you've been doing to really create opportunities for the breathing space within our communities being a better place? You know, we, we have not, as a, as a community, addressed environmental justice as effectively as we should. It's impacting everything we do. Uh, it's impacting uh, the schools our children attend. Uh, well, if they're older buildings, the buildings probably are sick. It's full of toxic in the building. It impacts the water we drink. You think about it, the Flint water crisis is now going on, what, seven years, and it's still a, a crisis. Uh, there's mm -hmm. not been any remediation to that. And what's fascinating, I grew up in Detroit, it became a crisis because the state took over the city and decided they was going to stop buying water from Detroit, which was the fresh water, and use the Flint River and they cut off the pipe from the Detroit uh, water system. I don't understand why the pipe hadn't just been turned back on. So they stopped drinking that bad water coming out of the Flint, right? Or at least uh, address the, inf the infrastructure of the piping. We have far too many communities, believe it or not, uh, that, that lack any running water. Right. Uh, on top of the, pollu of the pollutants. Fossil fuel is, is having an impact on the environment. Uh, renewable energy is the emerging reality. And if I go to high wealth communities and I see solar panels on a roof and I see windmills in the field, I say, well, if they got it, then there must be something to this. Exactly. So we need to get into the get into this process. So environmental justice is, is an important uh, space for civil rights advocacy because it impacts everything we do. It's a reason why we are uh, have a high concentration of asthma. Uh, 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 in our community, but because of asthma and diabetes and others, we're also more susceptible to COVID-19. So it's a multiplier effect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And so as we think about all of those issues, we touched on it a little bit, um, and I would just like to give you an opportunity. Um, policy is critical. Uh, any specific legislation that you and your organization is working on that you're advocating uh, within this forthcoming Congress at all? We're going to be building out a, a complete policy agenda, much of which we've been advocating for years. But, you know, you could go everything from the student loan crisis that so many 
people are confronted with, and, and perhaps so many of your members. Uh, student loans is, it was necessary for many of us to get in school, but when we start giving back to our communities by being government workers, teachers, mm -hmm. uh, the cost of the education has become, is not, is not marketable in terms of the profession that majority of African Americans are in. There's an existing program, the uh, public service student loan program, that you can have your loans discharged after 10 years. We're gonna be advocating that as an immediate discharge if you qualify for that program. We need more teachers, not less. And the way you do that is you make the education degree more marketable. When you start looking at voting, we should not make voting a partisan issue. The administration of elections should be the norm and vote and the process of campaigning is the partisanship. We've mm -hmm. conflated the two things to be the same. Uh, we're gonna be putting forth a whole a program not only reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act, but just looking at the administration election holistically so we don't keep bumping our head on the same reality. When you look at environmental issues, we need to tighten up uh, how we approach uh, environmental issues, but most importantly, there will be a major infrastructure bill come out this Congress. It'll probably be a multi-trillion dollar bill. It will both create jobs, but also open up opportunities for our communities uh, in terms of the infrastructure, the sewage, the water lines, and, and the roads, the streets, when that when that money come out, we got to make sure it is applied to the communities most in need, and not the community that that's, that has the most greed. And, you know, I can go on and on. So yeah, there would be a comprehensive package that we're looking at, and we got to be aggressive about it. Moving from this moment of protest in the street, power at the ballot box, to public policy to address structural racism. Absolutely, and I would just welcome the opportunity as you finalize that, please get that to us because we can be some great foot soldiers, we can be some great partners with you on really driving that. Uh, this is my last question for you, uh, Derek, and this one's kind of personal for me and for us. Um, I touched on it uh, at the opening, but I'd like to give you an opportunity to just talk a little bit more. Uh, James Weldon Johnson, one of our revered members, uh, many uh, in the audience certainly know that name, uh, the author of the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice. Uh, but what many might not know, Derek, is that uh, um, Brother Johnson was a stalwart uh, within your organization, a revered member. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the impact uh, that Brother Johnson had within the NAACP, and then talk a little bit, if you don't mind, on what his legacy mean to you as the president and CEO of the NAACP. You know, James Wonder Johnson served in this position under a different title. I think they called it executive director at the time, right? Uh, mm -hmm. He was one of the key uh, uh, members of the NAACP to steward us through some of the most difficult times of any organization, a new organization, in the midst of a level of racial hatred that was condoned by local governments and states alike. Um, he was a visionary, part of Harlem Renaissance, a teacher. You know, when he wrote the poem, Lift Every Voice, it was only a poem. And his right. brother added the music to the poem. Yeah. And that poem is profound. When President Obama talked about uh, our history, our legacy, making democracy work, uh, you know, I thought about the lyrics, Stony the Rose Retry, Bitter the Chastity Rye, you know, because it tells of the journey of African Americans in this country. And it navigates all the way through that journey to making sure that we're not drunk with the wine of the world. You right. know, lest our feet stray from the places we met thee. But then when it end, stand true to our native land, stand true to our God. Our native land for me reflect, stand true to the African diaspora, right. who we are as a people while at the exact same time, making sure we have our connection with God. And connection God, with God with me goes to Proverbs uh, 31, eight. Uh, who will speak for those who cannot speak for themselves? And that's the, that's the charge that I've taken for myself. That is the role of the NAACP, being an advocacy voice necessary for the communities who created the space for me to sit in the seat that I'm sitting in, but, but, but in that, at that same time may not have the voice to advocate for their community, may not have the voice or the skill set to, to be in spaces to make sure that they are not being preyed upon, may not have the voice to ensure that police officers, when they come to their community, are actually protecting and serving and not praying on. It is our role as an organization to heed the history lesson in that 
in that poem, Call Lift Every Voice. Look at the example of a James Weldon Johnson, someone who gave up his, of his time and talent to steward this organization so we can uh, be true to our native land, true to our God. Absolutely. Well, wow, what a great dissertation uh, of who he was and the impact he's had in your organization and certainly uh, the impact and reverence that we have of him uh, within Phi Beta Sigma. Uh, well, Derek, I want to certainly thank you for being with us today. Uh, I want you to know uh, we're extremely appreciative of our partnership with you. Uh, you should know that one of my proudest moments as international president was when we signed our MOU uh, with your organization uh, because we saw just such rich history uh, between the two. We certainly knew the impact you were making within the community and we felt like we certainly could collaborate in that regard. I uh, certainly wanna thank you for serving as a panelist uh, for our real reform uh, that we did earlier this year, uh, people, yeah. police, and policy. Uh, you added great value and great voice uh, to the robust discussion we had with those police chief on what they were doing uh, within our communities. I certainly wanna thank you for that. Uh, but you know, I think it's important uh, when you're able to really solidify partnership uh, you create an opportunity for an investment. And I'm very proud this morning, um, Derek, to share with you that Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity will be donating $50,000 uh, to the NAACP. Uh, we'll be doing that to start in collaboration with you. Uh, Phi Beta Sigma, James Weldon Johnson Scholarship. What a great opportunity it. on the subjects that we've talked about this morning uh, to yeah. provide uh, funding for students all across this country to advance their academic excellence uh, through higher ed. And what a great opportunity for us to collaborate and partner. So really proud of the work you're doing and really thankful for the partnership. You, I, I do want to say that uh, the, my state treasurer here in Mississippi, who's a Sigma, you just made his day. So he's going to hold this over my head for the next two years. Uh, he's going to remind me that whether, how the Sigma stand up. So thank That's you. Right. Uh, we really appreciate it, and uh, I, I really appreciate the partnership. Thank you very much. Absolutely, absolutely. So as I go into just my closing comments, you know, I started this program saying uh, 2020 has been a very, very tough year. Turbulent times. But you know what? With all things, this too shall pass. You know, we also know without faith, work is dead. And so before we go, I've got some ask. I've got some work I'm going to ask this audience to do. And I think it's very important. Number one, for everyone who's listening, I'm going to ask you, because I know everybody on the call, everybody's watching, I know you're already registered. So I'm not going to ask you to register, but I'm going to ask you to make sure you register someone else. But as I ask you to register someone else, I'm also gonna ask when you go to the polls, take someone else to the polls with you. To the brothers who are watching, you and I both know that um, we had three founders and we've already talked, Derek and I just had great conversation around the fact that in 2016, we were disproportionately absent at the ballot box. And so I'm gonna ask you to do more because the sisters, they're moving fast and we gotta catch up with them. And so as we ask the broader audience to register one, I'm gonna ask the brothers to register three individuals for voter registration. And then I'm gonna ask you, as you go to the polls, I want you to take three more people to the polls with you. We've got to close that gap and we've got to do it at the pace that our sisters have done it. And then I wanna suggest think about something because we know that weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. On November the 4th, we saw in 2016 that we were weeping and weeping hard. But as I was about to say on November the 4th of this year, we know that joy is cometh in the morning. And so I wanna thank you for joining us this morning. I wanna thank you, Derek, again, for participating with us. Uh, I want to wish the audience that I have having a great rest of the morning, but more importantly, having a great weekend. Continue to keep the faith and may God bless you. Thank you very much.